Hello. How you doing? It's me, Mr. Chike Evans. And I am about to have a conversation with Miss Nikki Gilbert Daniels. Just waiting for her to pop in the room. What's up, Kev? Welcome to the room. Just waiting for Miss Daniels to pop in. Hey Kev, how's my lighting? Does everything look okay on your end? I feel like I need more light. Thank you, sir. You know, photographer extraordinaire, you know I trust your your opinion. Welcome, welcome to the room. Waiting for Miss Nikki. Hi. Welcome to the to the live. My friend, hi Miss Lanier Love, create some ish, Providence movie executive producer, <laughs> the lady of the hour has joined. Hi. <laughs> yeah. You're so pretty. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're so handsome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I want to geek out before I get to business. I have been trying to interview you for so long. For no so way, long. really. And I'm so <laughs> to finally have you. I'm so thankful. Ah, uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad yeah. to finally be here. And shout out to your team, uh, Tosha Davis. A yes, plus. she's plus. the real deal, ain't she? Ain't she, ain't Tosha you. and Pam both, they the real <laughs> deal. <laughs> yeah. So how have you been? I've been well. I have been well. I have been, I'm, I'm doing some work. I'm away doing some work, and it just happens to bring me closer to the water. So I'm yeah. really excited about that, that I get to, in between time, in between, between trying to make some moves, I get to get some healing. The ocean is just like, it just brings me to a place of centered and um peace and uh, i don't know i think it's because we all we are we all come from salt water right Absolutely. you know i posted something yesterday our tears are salt water our sweat is salty and the ocean just has a way of restoring me so i'm, I'm glad to be here <laughs> and uh yeah. no offense to daniels but i've seen you in your bikini you're looking white well mom Oh, thank right you. Way. No, he would be happy to hear that. We said we both, we're, we're in our, you know, I'm 51 in July, and he's 51 with me for a, for a minute. Not long, but he's 51 with me for a minute. So we said we have to be in really great shape moving forward. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's yeah. good. So, so thank how you. have you been with this whole pandemic thing and, and being sequestered? How, how are you dealing with that? 
You know, it's interesting. I saw someone else talking about it, and they were like, you know, I am an ambivert, so I'm a person who is like, hey, let's go. Let's, hey, let's have a good time. Okay, so now I need to go and recharge my energy and just be by myself for some time. So ambiverts are people who fall in the middle, I guess, of introvert and extra, extrovert, um, a little of both quality. So that worked for me. The pandemic was not such a bad thing. Um, you know, I was really disappointed that, you know, everything stopped because prior to the pandemic, you know, I had a lot of stuff going on personally and professionally. We were just kind of getting the ball rolling with Brownstone again. And then it was just like, nope, stay home. Don't go nowhere. You can't do nothing. Call my friends at networks. They're like, oh, we ain't even in the office. What you talking about? So it was a good uh, reset. It was a good reset. I wasn't complaining. I got to be Nana, wife, mom, cook, do some home repairs. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. Yes. So I know we kind of just jumped right into it, but I'm speaking with Ms. Nikki Gilbert Daniels, uh, <laughs> one of the singers of Brownstone. She yeah. is creator, co producer of R&B Divas. She is Miss from the Bottom Up TV, uh, <laughs> Merge TV. Like, you have so much going on. And yeah. one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because you've always seemed to embody Phoenix energy. And oh, you wow. would spring up with something out of nowhere in a heartbeat. You give it to us and then you'll dip off for a minute and then you'll come back and you hit us with something else. You dip off for a minute. Talk yeah. a little bit about the work ethic and, and some of the things you have going on. Wow, well, thank you. Phoenix energy is a really huge compliment. I've never heard it and I receive it. Mm -hmm. um, because I do, you know, one thing I, I think I got for, I get it from my mama, that resilient spirit, you know what I mean? Yeah. That ability to just continue to evolve and grow. Um, you know, I just, I'm a creative in every sense of the word. I create content. I'm not just someone who likes to be on stage performing it. I'm not always the person who has to be front and center of it. You know, as I'm getting older, I'm actually enjoying more the process of creating and writing and providing platforms for other people. So um, it's really just about stretching my creativity in my mind and seeing how far I can take things. And, you know, life happens. Um, you have an idea, you throw something against the wall, you think it's going to stick, it doesn't, you have to figure out, okay, so what do we do? You know, let's go on to the next thing. And I like to think of myself as sort of a network in my mind. So I come up with these show ideas. I come up with great stories I believe are, you know, things that I believe are great stories and just really try to identify people that I think would be great to be a part of it. As in the case of R&B Divas, that was born of, you know, a show I did called Soul Kittens Cabaret, which people don't know. All the ladies from R&B Divas were a part of the Soul Kittens Cabaret thing. So it was just kind of like it evolves from, from one thing to the next. And I'm glad that God gives me the ability to, to what do they say? Um, Pivoting is, is, is staying on course in terms of the bottom line, but just figuring out a different way of accomplishing the goal, you know? So right. goal is always the same. Entertain, uplift, yeah. and inspire people. Yeah. I always tell mm -hmm. people, especially young people that are artists trying to, mm -hmm. you know, climb. And I say, you know, the door that you envision isn't always the door that opens up for you. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be sometime it'll be the basement sometime it'll be a crack yeah. in the door wall you yeah. know you never know how you yeah. get it. But yeah when you get that opportunity kill it yeah. yes opportunity I, it, it was was it Oprah who said um success is when opportunity and preparation meet so I'm yeah. just like you know a world of ideas so I'm always prepared somebody's like oh we're looking for an ensemble oh we're looking for a thriller oh we're looking for I look I got it <laughs> what you need? What you need? Remember, uh, what's his name on Good Times? Uh, he opened up his coat and he got the spoons and he's got the, you know, I'm aging myself. Lynette, that's my husband's name. Yeah, I'm I'm Nick Gad. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. So let's go back to you're from Detroit, right? Yes, of course. So little girl from Detroit, how does she make it to sing? and be a part of and, and part creator of this booming girl group that Michael Jackson put on his imprint. Like, how does that happen? 
the universe, for starters, God, um, energy that you put out coming back. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the, the real reasons. Uh, the reasons that I think entertain people is um, I was actually in Eastern Michigan University on a college scholarship. And my best friend at the time, Dwayne Barnes, like the only brother I knew growing up, um, he had gone and seen Dead Poet Society. And he ran back to my room. He's like, Nikki, oh my God, I saw Dead Poet Society. You got to see it. You got to see it. He's like, you know, seize the day, carpe diem, do it while you're young. You know, we're in school on theater scholarships. We've been in Corlear since high school. We need to just go to LA. We need to just make it happen. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to check it out. So then it was like, after that, it was like, oh, let's do it. Let's use our <laughs> Pell Grant money and um, get our tickets. <laughs> let's try to figure it out as we go along. Once we get there, let's persevere and make it happen. So um, we did. We went to L.A., you know, struggled for the first few years, went, went on a few auditions and, and was told quite often that I was just, you know, Great voice, cute face, but I just didn't fit the mold of a superstar, and that's mm -hmm. what they were looking for. So I had that struggle quite a bit. And then I decided, you know what, another one of those, let's, let's figure out how to pivot. Same goal, mm -hmm. let's figure out how to do this. So I decided that I wanted to put a group together, so I put an ad in the drama log. I was sleeping on Dwayne's floor, and I was like, look, I'm put this group together. He's like, you're going to put a group together? What do you know about? I'm like, well, at least that way we can focus on the music and the harmonies and the soul, and it's not so much about what I look like. And if I'm standing between two people who are not as big as I am, then it kind of decorates the group a little bit. Didn't know it wasn't <laughs> just going to be decorations. It was going to be some singing heifers um, in Maxi and Vimi. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, I put together this audition. I'll never forget. Maxi sung... Um, Boys to men, me saying something, jazz. We were actually five. And then, like, a few weeks into it, a couple, the two other girls dropped off. And we just said, you know, we're going to keep focused. So, wrote our music, had our little demos and stuff together. Walking out through Melrose, Maxie got stranded. I'm sorry, Maxie got selected by this independent artist to be the star of his video. So, I was like, look, I'll go. I'll be like your manager. So I go and I'm like <laughs> networking with people. One of the tires blows out. We get stranded. The guy that I stayed behind, I said, I'll stay behind since y'all can catch the light. I want to network a little bit and see, you know, what we can make of this. Long story short, ne nobody ever came to get us. Stranded in the middle of banning, past banning, actually, in the desert. He left me, got into an El Camino with some white men, and I was from Detroit, so I wasn't doing that. Crying, praying came up on a police station, called Mimi. She came to pick me up. And then a couple days after that, the guy Shep called and was like, I heard my friend left you stranded. I'm sorry. I want to make it up to you. I'm going to take you to meet Barry Kolsky at Emerald Forest. Do you have anything to play for him? Opportunity and preparation. I go meet right. Barry Kolsky. We sing our songs. Barry goes, mm, that's cool, but not really what we do here, not what we're looking for. On the way out the door, Linda Blum and Marla McNally, the two owners of the publishing company, just happened to be downstairs. And they were like, what was that we heard upstairs? And we're like, oh, is that music here? You want to hear it? Tell, tell me. I think that's what we sang. Oh, my God, this is amazing. Did you write it? Mm -hmm. Come back three days later. Sang the song and said, we know some people that you should meet. We want to be your publishers. We're going to take you to meet them. Long story short, they took us to meet Jerry Greenberg. Jerry introduced us to the team over there, Michael, all those people, and they gave us a record deal. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot more in that, which is a part of this book I'm working on. But, yeah, it was just, you know, never really giving up and figuring out how to, you know, make it happen. Yeah. And so fast forwarding, you know, we lost Maxie. Yes. And I just <laughs> yes. So, um Rest her soul, dynamic yes. talent, and a beautiful woman. She is with um, she is with me always. Yeah. <laughs> she is with us always. That's yes. really cool. Um, and I remember during that time you had did a lot of press, and you were talking about you lost the love of music during that time, of I guess the grieving. How yeah, and, and to 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 be totally honest with you, I kind of lost the passion for music prior to Maxie passing away. Mm -hmm. um, right. I just kind of had figured out, not early on, but, you know, towards the end of the group and whatever, I just kind of realized that the industry was very different for, for artists like us. And um, mm -hmm. 
I just became disenchanted with it. And I felt like there was just more to do. I was always labeled a troublemaker because I asked so many questions, you know, I, I wanted things to be right before, you know, <laughs> whatever. So I kind of became a little disenchanted with it and not as interested. So I started developing other things and I got into did like an episode of sister sister. I think I did Martin. I was like, I'm gonna try acting. Let's see if maybe this will be because that was what was happening in the nineties. A lot of the hip hop artists and R and B artists more with hip hop with LL and Latifah, but they were crossing over into TV and film. So I, I actually, did a table read for Cleo and set it off. But you know, they gave it to the queen. Oh. I ain't hating on the queen. <laughs> we came up in the same auditions a few times because we were similar types. And um, right. I just wanted to focus on acting. So, so, but after Maxie's death, it, was, it wasn't just music. It was, remember Charlize Theron and Monster? Yes. Very I was much. about to be, I was about to be, <laughs> I felt this spirit of just, yeah, I don't even really like to talk about it. It was more than just me falling out of love with music after Maxie died. It was so much. So she literally, dark, I'm sorry. Kind of, Are you saying dark? Dark energy. Was it kind of dark? Oh, it was very, oh yeah. I mean, in addition to that, you know, it's no secret. I was in the middle of a huge lawsuit and Maxie literally died. Um, a week before I was supposed to go into arbitration with these people. So I shut down completely. I don't even know what happened with the lawsuit. I really couldn't even tell you. My lawyers were like, we'll just handle it to, you know, don't talk to me about that. That's the least important thing in my life. Right. Um, so it, it was just very dark. Mm -hmm. There. Wow. Because <laughs> I was just like, oh, hell no, this is not going to happen. I'm about to just... Complete. And not that I was going to be violent towards anybody because I just don't have that spirit unless I'm like defending my life in the moment or someone that I love. But I really felt completely um, deflated. I guess that's yeah. probably the best word because she was my best friend. She was not just my group member. She was my best. She was my sister. And and, and then all the memories and the, and the components that go into creating what you guys created you know, that's your life. That, yes. That's your sister. You know, that's, yes. that's a meat of your existence. Exactly. It is the reason yeah. people know who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you began to develop Soul Kittens, what were you yeah. thinking about those stories that you put together for those characters when you were creating that? Did that come from so there? So it's interesting. You know, Soul Kittens Cabaret, um, was obviously that was well before Maxi. I wrote Soul Kittens Cabaret in 2004. Okay. Um, and yes, and, the, and Soul Kittens Cabaret was, um, I started writing it in 2004. And I was on the road with Tyler Perry. I started writing a little bit before, but I was on the road with Tyler Perry playing Vera Brown, you shy, don't play with me. Uh, <laughs> the alcoholic aunt Vera Brown. Um, and I saw that Tyler was so hugely successful. I mean, we were selling out theaters everywhere, as he is mm -hmm. today. Um, mm -hmm. And I was talking to Lucia, who worked with him as his company manager, who is now my partner. Um, we were talking about, you know, just, I was like, yo, is this really that lucrative? And she's just like, none of your business. Just pay attention to the audience. You know, I like, just learn for yourself. And in that moment, I started, I was like, I'm going to finish this Soul Kittens Cabaret thing. So I wrote this show that was basically centered around, my mom is a jazz singer in Detroit. And they had a lot of clubs that was like little juke joints in like you know little spots you know what I mean and um the women and the people there were just um this place called Burt's place called Baker's Keyboard Lounge which is one of the oldest jazz clubs in the country um or if not the oldest um and I would hear these stories all the time and I would see my mom and her friends my mother would have rehearsals in her house in the in our house in the living room the musicians would come over we had a piano you know her girlfriends would come and they were rehearsing those are where a lot of those stories came from in addition to the fact that i i noticed in the music industry there were all these women with all of these um incredible trials that they had to endure while still getting on stage and performing for people you know what i mean and the reason we wanted to make it burlesque is because we felt like it needed to be sexy and provocative and different. Mm -hmm. And yes. I wanted it to be something that could cross urban theater and Broadway because I know Tyler had the urban theater market. 
sewn up, but I was like, this could be something that could really bridge the communities, especially with Tata Burlesque, which, you know, was the yeah. first, well, okay, now we use the terms gender fluid, right, or non-binary, right, yeah. but at the time, he was just this gay man who was cross-dresser, which is what we referenced, and mm -hmm. I was so proud of the fact that this character represented that and the, and the camaraderie with the women, and he reminded me of women that we had encountered, um, I'm sorry, men and people that worked with us in the industry that were so supportive and so loving and such a great shoulder to cry on. So Soul mm -hmm. Kittens Cabaret has Selena, Angie, Monifa, <laughs> um, Trinise. Kenya Moore was actually supposed to perform in the show, but um, she and I were best friends years ago. Um, just a really, Tatiana Ali, an incredible cast of people. Faith has yeah. done it. Fantasia has done it. So yeah. Um, you know, I can go on and on because my, my, my history is so far back. I'm an old ass lady. But Soul <laughs> Kittens was my baby. It was the first thing that I had done seven, almost 17 years ago. And it, it gave life to what became R&B Divas because we filmed the behind the scenes, like the making of. And we're like, okay. this would make for a great TV show. So I'm sorry, I got a little off track. So we actually had like this little reality docu-series, which we still got all the footage. <laughs> is that, is that the sizzle reel that I saw? Because I saw a sizzle reel yes, before yes, R&B Divas. Yes, okay. yes, okay. it was oh, probably the sizzle reel. Well, no, the R&B Divas, we had done an R&B Divas sizzle reel called Diary of the Diva. Um, mm -hmm. But Sokin's Cabaret was a is actually like that was before I understood as a TV producer that you can't just let cameras roll and cameras be going for hours just taping everything. You have to set up the shots and, and know what you're getting. So Sokin's Cabaret is just that like, my God, I have probably three or four boxes of tape from that. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Wow. So there's, there's that we haven't seen before. You have performances we haven't seen before. Yes. Okay. So the so yes. Yeah, so so there have been several little um, low key productions of Soul Kids Cabaret since two thousand and five. Okay. Right. Like we did calls um, New York. Sarah Soaks was a part of it. Joy from um, Joyce from the Good Girls. Like we've always had some really dope people. Tom Delea, amazing. But um, the actual DVD, which was done in 2011 with Fantasia and Faith, is the only like full blown production that you can see. All the others were like, you know, we did a show in Detroit, we did a little limited thing in Atlanta. Um, so yeah, there's footage and tape that you've never seen. Wow. <laughs> Got a lot of that everywhere. Wow. You know, I, I often wanted to see, have you ever seen, um, there's a documentary and it's about uh, background singers. Uh, one of the yes. Ones. Oh my God. It is amazing. Oh like, yeah. I saw it. Get the name of it. It's, like it's five called, feet. um, Oh God, I saw it. Oh God. 15 feet or 25 15 feet, feet or from something. stardom or 20. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's it. From that's stardom. It. Yep. Um, I, Lisa Fisher. Oh, so good. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always <laughs> been you doing a documentary film about r and divas and the history of the African-American diva in this country. Going all the way back, bringing it all the way back. I always vision, envision you doing that. I've seen that. Well, you know, I've, without saying too much, we are, I am working on this project that is more centered around my experiences as an R&B diva. Um, mm -hmm. I did invite the ladies to participate and there's an open invitation for them to participate, but you know, everybody's got a lot going on right now. Um, uh, but it's called diary of a diva. And it just kind of, you know, sh the journey from the very beginning from singing with the brush in the garage in Detroit, um, mm -hmm. we're actually doing some stuff here now. I just feel like our stories get so diluted with the bullshit. I'm sorry, with the BS. Um, <laughs> we get here. <laughs> oh, because here. Okay, good. So our stories get so diluted with the bullshit um, and just sort of the, the, you know, the the idea that you have to monetize everything and that our stories organically just are not enough. And I don't regret any of my experiences as a producer who got played, who didn't know that I needed to protect myself with ownership, because those are the things that have taught me, once again, back to what we talked about earlier, to just kind of evolve through it. And, and, and now that's what, you know, the next 
phase of my life is about, this Worth TV initiative, so we know that we can do exactly what you said, go and get women together and really tell our stories organically. And it's unfortunate that so many people have been burned by this reality TV, you know, iron, like literally branded. <laughs> it's crazy yeah. that people are afraid of even doing anything close to it. But I think that it's important for you know, people who support our music for the legacy of R&B, for us to just tell the truth about what it really is, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It is the only way people will ever learn how to avoid some of the pitfalls. And that's what the whole point of us being successful artists is about, not to just entertain people and put on makeup and be cute and sing, but to also, you know, share our truths um, through our music and show our lives as they organically are, you know? True. So I would love for other people to join this whole Diary of a Diva movement, because I think it's important. Okay. Before we look up and everybody's too old, you see all this gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can I ask you as a fan, not Chike Evans, the journalist, but as a fan, what mm -hmm. in the hell happened in layman's terms to R&B Diva? Why is it not on TV anymore? Well, again, I believe that everything happens in divine order. You know what I mean? True. I think it was just the time was over for it. Um, that is, again, I like to give the real answer, and then I like yeah. to get a human answer. Um, <laughs> and the human answer is I think that um, we just didn't trust each other enough. I think we went into it with this idea that we were going to stick together and ride this out with each other and, um, you know, turn this into something that could go as many seasons as a Housewives or any of these other shows. Yeah. And I think that because we were all established um, prior to the show and we were real friends, um, it was particularly disappointing because, you know, to wake up every day to people that you want to just entertain and you want, you know, people say they don't care what people think, but we want people to enjoy what we do. We want people to like us. We want people to. Uh -huh. So when you have to protect your brand and the only way that you can protect your brand is to walk away from something that, you know, is, is causing harm, um, mm. I don't blame any of those women. I hate that the friendships and the sisterhoods, a lot of them have been destroyed as a result mm. of, you know, people wanting to just take something and turn it into something that was more about, again, revenue. Let's have, what do we do? To, what do we need to do to get eyeballs? You know, let's have somebody split the table. Let's have Nikki and Selena hate each other. Let's have, you know, Kelly and this person hate each other. And it's sad because the relationships to this day um, are still not um, healthy. Or, I mean, I guess they're healthy for the individuals because people are like, I ain't, I don't deal with yeah. you. I'm good. But it's just sad that we haven't had the opportunity to really turn that brand into what it could have really been. And I had conversations with Think Factory Media since, and they were very transparent. And they're like, you know, we, we, we hate that it ended up this way. Hindsight 2020, we wish that things had gone differently. You know what I mean? Um, right. I've had conversations with a lot of the women and everybody feels the same way. But for some reason, I think that the, the scars run so deep that people are really afraid to go into it anymore. And then the other part of it is I'm not doing anything else that I don't own. Period. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. That's it. And that's not about ego. <laughs> that's about protecting legacy. And that's about generational wealth. And that's about if yeah. you're going to have my likeness and my name and my face, you already own everything else. We're not making no money off streaming. We're not making no money off the music we create. You're not going to just take and completely destroy you know, my brand, and I don't want to see it happen to anybody else. And I would never do that to anyone. So I'm very confident that if we did move forward, and the women did decide, hey, let's do this together, that we would be very successful. The fans would have exactly what they were looking for when they came for season one of r and yeah. Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> and that would be what it would be about. Okay. That was a very great answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. So it's the truth. You being, being such a strong woman, and I cannot foresee anyone mm -hmm. stepping to you sideways and being able to get away with it for any reason. Mm -hmm. Industry, being a very attractive woman, have you experienced any Me Too in your career when it comes to your talent and trying to get your talent to the masses? 
or just just being um, in the room? I never experienced Me Too from the perspective of um, any sort of sexual advances. I mean, you know, yeah, I've had like, you know, I met Suge a long time ago. He was like, hey, what's up? And, you know, other than that, but it wasn't anything like, trust me, it wasn't nothing inappropriate. It was just, you know, that's as close as it gets. Like, you know, you're kind of cute, you know, but we the same age. So that wasn't, it, was, it wasn't that. Um, other than that, no, I've never experienced it. And wouldn't experience it now because I've been with my husband for almost 18 years and he's 6'8 and military and not of this life and this business. So I think most people are wise enough um, to know that you don't want to step to me that way. Um, but I have had um, absolutely, um, I've had to experience the lack of gender inequality and um, being someone who created, like we, my, we literally created the show, paid for the sizzle reel for R&B Divas, broadcast all of it. And people just came over like, nope, this, we gonna take this. So I've wow. had that. Oh yeah, no, it was very like, um, it was a very strategic, let me, I'm sorry. I know it, folks watch everything and interpret. Nobody said, nope, we gonna take this. They didn't say that. That's not what they said. But their actions were, um, yeah, you're an executive producer, but you have no power. And you have no power because we've arranged for that to be something in terms of the paperwork and what it says and what you say. And it was my first time. So where you look at Issa Rae and you look at Ava DuVernay and you look at and Mona and some of these other people who mm -hmm. are just really doing things, I look back and I'm like, wow, in, in 2011, I created this really amazing show. And I guess back then it wasn't popular to give Black women the credit that they deserve for the things that they created. It created a franchise. It created a spinoff that, quote unquote, Hollywood Divas wasn't R&B Divas, but, you know, whatever. Um, right. But I ended up having to go to court, you know, pretty much lose everything, fight for my life, fight for my rights. And I'm not saying this as a woe is me sort of violin moment, but you asked about me too. No, me two times out, up, no. But inequality, not protecting black women, <laughs> um, forcing us to fight each other, um, the disrespect financially, you know, I was paid less than everybody else, all of that. So I have had that experience for sure. Wow. On the most and the successful TV franchise for the network. And the reason that I ask that, because I'm, I'm cool with Monifa and with Faith, too. And um, I yeah. think that, that that narrative is important to have out there for these people that are trying to have a foray into the industry. And they think it's all sweet and gumdrops, and it really isn't. And you have to be about your business. You have to be about your business, and you need to protect your, um, your creative property. Yeah. Intellectual property protection is a really big deal. And yeah. unfortunately... They don't teach you that because it's not really important for us to know it. Just like back in the day when I was 23 years old and I signed my deal with Sony, I didn't know. I was 23. And then when I transitioned from that to pivoted into TV production at 30 something, I didn't know. I'd never done TV before. I thought I was being covered, but in fact, it was like, nope, we want this too. I know now. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. I know now. So this is why it's like you say there, there are moments and breaks. I've been offered. Yeah, I've been offered. I've been offered shows, big ones, some of the most popular, like, hey, you would be great to throw into this cast of this or you would be great. And I'm just not doing it if I don't have ownership. It's just not, you know, it's tough. I'm, it's a struggle. I'm not doing it. But let's face it and, and, and keep it all the way of being. You made the network a whole lot of money, a whole lot of money. And why wouldn't they call you? Because you're, you're a moneymaker. You're bankable. Why wouldn't they call you? Why wouldn't you have a whole bunch of offers coming your way? Because they know what you can do. And now we arrive at Worth TV. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Because now you know. Because now I know. Because now I know. And I wish... To God that I could like take what's in my brain that I know and like pop it into other people's heads because we get so caught up in going to other platforms and other networks and again I don't want to be the girl that is always rolling up my sleeves trying to have it out I would love to have a really solid great creative 
um, amicable, equitable relationship with lots of networks. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's just not set up for Black women to thrive that way. Black men don't have that problem. Um, LBGTQ community is thriving more than just the average Black female woman showrunner, right? I've been pitching, you know, and again, it's hard to even have these conversations without quote unquote calling people out or, or doing something that people would look to as shade. I'm not shade. I'm very direct. I don't do the whole like shade for points thing. Right. But I'm looking at like this iteration of this new girl group show that, you know, people are like, oh, is this this new show? Is this that Carlos King is doing with the girl groups and the whatever? I was pitching something similar. And it's just, you know, yeah, he's Carlos King. He's from Detroit. I love him. He's dope. I'm not no shade at all here. But it's right. easier for Carlos and for you know, all the other male um, producers and content creators to really get through the door than it is for black women. I have incredible show ideas. That one that is greenlit and, and moving and shaking, I'm like, oh, this was me and Faith been on the phone, talk about do it, you know, and then you look up and there it is. Um, so Work TV is me finally saying as difficult as it will be a journey, right? It will be a challenge to convince people that we can start a streaming service. Women, Work TV is women in reality, film, television, and music, right? And it is a, an incubator so we can develop and nurture and educate and inform and empower and inspire young female creatives. It is a streaming platform where we can show our films, our shorts, our features, our music videos, our stories of the making of, the show that you talked about, the diva show, you know, <laughs> Diary of a Diva, is what, you know, and imagine if you had every Black woman in the industry that everybody loves, right? Your Tarangis, your Gabrielles, your Lizzo's, your, if, if all of us with this melanin in the entertainment industry all came together and said, you know what? we're going to endorse this, even if it isn't worth TV. If, if someone else did it for Black women and was like, I'd be like, yo, here I am. Let's go. I'm on board. But because it doesn't really exist out there, I think Ava DuVernay is doing a ray, which is great, but it's more like crew and stuff like that, which it'll evolve, obviously, into more. But imagine all these women coming together and directing their fan bases and directing their, their audiences to this platform being right. able to help empower other young filmmakers. Taranji, I'm, I'm just throwing these names out here because they're coming into my mind, but she doesn't even have to like do anything except say, hey, here's this young filmmaker from Detroit or Minnesota. She's got a new movie that she just did. It's amazing. Go watch it. Yes. That data, that currency gets us in, on people's radar. It means that all these black films, Claudine and Women of Brewster's Place and For Color Girls and Lady Sings the Blues and all this amazing content that black women have been a part of creating and developing and making work. Imagine if we could have one place, one platform, one streaming service where you could catch all things black girl magic. Wow. It doesn't mean it has to be exclusive. It doesn't mean that it has to be the only place. It just means that there's one place you know you can go where you can get something. And no shade to sisters that are out here twerking and w popping and whatever. But some of us, you know, we too old for twerking. Our backs ain't cut out and built like that. You know, <laughs> Our knees, and knees can't quite handle it. So for us <laughs> to be able to have a place where we can go and see images of ourselves that are who we are, and to own a piece of that, to have equity in it, to own it, to be able to leave mm -hmm. that legacy to our children and our children's children so they can benefit from our talents and our gifts. That's work. I have worked yeah. for Sony Music for almost 30 years, and I still wow. owe them people a million dollars. Wow. That's wow. no shade. Those are just facts. I have worked no, for yeah, Sony but... Music for 30 years. Hit record been spent with Tory Lanez, this one, that one, the third, sold at least five million albums somewhere, or if it was a million for the plaque, whatever. But the point is, right. I have no equity in that. Worth TV gives you equity. Worth TV is something. So we're building it from the bottom up, no pun intended. <laughs> it's an initiative. Um, my foundation, which is the title of our first Brownstone album, shout out to Pam Price, who is our chairman of the board 
and Tosha Davis, who's the CEO of the foundation, we've been busting our butts trying to get grants, trying to get support, trying to get people to understand this is not about me. And that's the hardest thing to push through in these conversations. It's not about me. Like some people are, I think, a little um, concerned that, okay, I created R&B Divas, it's going to be about me. R&B Divas wasn't about me. Part of the reason why I beef with those people is because I was defending them, my sisters. You know, they'll, they'll make it look like it was something else, yeah. but it's never about me because I don't want to be famous that bad. I get off on helping make other people famous. Check my track record. People make money with me. Sometimes often before I even make money my damn self, people make money with me. Wow. So there was a show from the bottom up, correct? There was a yes. uh, like a screen. Is, is <laughs> that things. something to transfer over to the network yes, as well? Yes, we're going to transfer that. And you'll be able to see. I tried to get the old episodes of R&B Divas to air on Worth TV as well. But, you know, we had to work. We're, and, and, and let me say this, because I know I've been talking about R&B Divas a lot. TV One has been really great about having conversations about with me about what's next. We are okay. past it. This was not a TV One issue on R&B Divas. This was really about Nikki Gilbert and Think Factory and Phil Thornton, but that's a whole other conversation. TV okay. One has been really inviting and welcoming and supportive and open to a lot of ideas. We've, we've been talking and are continue, continuing to talk about what's next. So um, I wanted to get R&B Divas on TV One. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that'll happen. But from the bottom up, which is on BET Her, who I also have a great relationship. Shout out to everybody at BET. Um, this is a wonderful series about, and it was created again, when I went, when I was going through this litigation, <laughs> it was breaking me completely down. So from the bottom up was the story of women who had been at the top of their game. Something happened, either it is a decision that they made or natural circumstances, whatever, um, where they hit rock bottom and they needed to work their way mm -hmm. back to the top. So that was Christine Beatty, who was in the Kwame Kilpatrick situation, and Sarah Stokes, who we did an amazing documentary called Broken Things, showing her life in sexual assault. She definitely experienced Me Too at the hands of her own father. Um, wow. So, yeah. So From the Bottom Up is is one of the series that we'll do. I'm so proud of it. We have Brandy Davis, who served 10 years in prison, and um, what, Kim Smedley, who did the illegal butt injections, was on the show, and Angela Stanton, who is a, probably the most controversial Black woman on the face of the earth. Uh, but also one of the smartest, I will say. Um, but she's super controversial. And, and Angie knows I don't agree with a lot of what she says. But, you know, what I do appreciate about her is that she's fearless. And she's not kissing ass for the sake of, you know, likes. Um, right. But we had a, a lot of really powerful women on that show who would hit rock bottom and show their climb to the top. So we want to continue to do that and hopefully have a new season of that as well. Cool. Very, very cool. You're doing some very productive things, my lady. Very yes, I'm trying not to look. It's just after 30 years in the business, I got a lot to say. So I'm trying not to talk too much, but I'm trying to get it all in there because it's like, oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. So thank you for being so gracious. But that's what this is for, <laughs> for that, for that purpose. Uh, and we, 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 we are hungry for more from Nikki Gilbert, you know. Oh, thank you. That, oh, I'm the I'm that chicken either. I'm kind of, I'm kind of up there in age and I, I have a soft spot for being able to go to a portal, whether it be your phone now, whether it be your computer, whether it be your television, and seeing us there. Um, yes. I remember for a long time, the only portal that we had for years was the Arsenio Hall show. You know, that was yes. the only time that we were able to see, you know, people like us entertain us. Or yeah. before that, it was full train. That was the only portal that we had to see us you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Saturday. And mm -hmm. RB Divas was that next thing for us. <laughs> it was incredible. And I mean, I have to say, I, I, I miss, I miss everybody. I miss, um, I feel like we, not, well, I don't want to say we were robbed because again, the universe d dictates all of that stuff. I don't think anybody has the power to take anything from you you're not, you're, that you're supposed to have. I think we needed to take a break to evolve into better people um, under, having a better understanding of who we were as individuals. And I, and I do, I am confident that when the stars align, it'll be back because it was a huge, it was a, it was a great show when it was good. 
And I also have to respect that people need to do whatever it is that they have to do to cleanse their spirit of the energy that wasn't so good because it was some not so good energy on there. And I'm not and I'm willing to compromise and sacrifice ever having it again if it ever had to go back to that. Right. Right. Yeah. So. What's, what's <clears throat> what else is going on now besides worth? Well, the content for Worth, um, we are super excited about some of the um, Social Conflict, which was a short film we did, which went into some festivals. We're actually developing it into a series, um, mm. which I'm super excited about. You know, um, it is based on a true story. Our high school music teacher was a pedophile. He was an awful human being, um, terrible, terrible human being. And um, he molested, he would have the boys in the choir. We would have the entire choir at his house for like, like before we went to competitions, the bus would come to his house. So our parents would drop us off the night before. And because, you know, we thought, oh, you know, he's non-binary, you know what I mean? So he's not going to be trying to get with the young girls or whatever. We had no idea that the young boys weren't protected. And one of my best friends who actually is the co-writer, co-director of the short, uh, Dwayne Barnes, director of the short, Dwayne Barnes, um, was one of the victims and he was really transparent about it. And, um, yeah, so we sensationalized it. I started writing it and I was like, is it okay if I, you know, help you share your story and tell the story? And the, and the entire story isn't about that. There's only the, the one piece, which in the beginning, you know, he get, the guy gets killed or whatever. But it tells the story of children who are struggling with mental health issues, with financial mm -hmm. issues at home, you know what I mean? With not being accepted because you're the nerd, with not being accepted because you're the tough guy from the streets, with not being accepted because you're the gay kid and you're the only girl, you know? So we talk a lot about a lot of issues that I think a lot of this industry is afraid of because things that are intelligent and make you think and represent where you really come from um, are often overlooked. But we're turning it into a series. And again, at Worth TV now, thank God for technology. All we need is a place to play it. And I believe the audience will come. So um, in addition to that, I'm working on a new film feature, independent, gritty, incredible. Oh, I'm so excited about this project. It's called Driven To It. It's a female ensemble um, right on time. So I'm actually taking meetings here uh, this week about it. And supporting my husband and his art. That's what we're meeting about um, here, you know, now just kind of evolving his art and having some really big conversations with some galleries here. So being creative and dope. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> I'm that you, you said yes to talking to me. Again, you know, I've been Thank wanting to talk to you. Me. <laughs> I think that you are a phenom. You're oh, a my gosh. Thank I, you. And um, you're one of my favorite artists. And I. Oh, my God. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. That's You don't understand. It's unusual because people think I'm just, you know, no pun, Cruella. I said, I might as well just wear it. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. Oh, Thank yeah, you. absolutely. And um, please keep me in mind with anything that you're doing with Worth because I am a producer. I'm also really? a filmmaker. Yes. Oh, wow. And oh, well, that's a done, done data. Yeah. You know what I'm, I left out, which is a very important um, thing. To, to mention is Work TV, in addition to it being a place for women of color, we also have our LBGTQ initiatives. And we definitely want to make sure that those voices are represented in everything that we do because, you know, our community, both Black women, you know, um, LBGTQ community, and Black men are so often um, neglected. So this is just a safe haven for us to just be creative and do dope shit. I want everybody to come to work and do dope shit. So I'm going to be calling you about that. <laughs> we had to stop. I'm sorry. My nose is running a little bit. We had to stop um, the presses to take care of some business, we'll call it, um, in terms of our development. Can't do everything coming out of a pandemic. But um, we're starting to get our wheels turning again. So it'll be active and live in the fall. Looking forward to it. Yes. Oh, mental Tell health. Me. Pam just said that. Mental health. I got to plug that. That we is are... APEC. Okay. You understand? That's, That's it. Beginning, middle, and end. All of it. Yes. 
So uh, yep. we want to have a safe haven for, and it's just so much more than a streaming platform. It is a place where people can go and connect with, with, with people who care and people who understand it's not just about entertaining people. It's about using our platform and the media to really educate and form and empower our kids. We have to meet them where they are. They're on these phones. They're on these streaming platforms. We have to meet them where sure. they are, and that's what Work TV is. I love it. I love it. I want to be a part. I love it. <laughs> I'm excited. That's dope. Hey, Mo, I see you, Mo. Yes, mental health is paramount, indeed. Yes. So tell people where they can find you, follow you, keep up with you. Um, you can find me at Nikki with two C's and I-C-C-I Gilbert on all platforms. And WorthTV.com, please go to WorthTV.com. Just register. It's free. We just need your email so that we can let you know when the dope shit really happens. And um, outside of that, just keep praying for the hustle and the grind, you know, and I'm praying for all of, I want everybody like us to win. Absolutely. <laughs> Miss Nikki Gilbert Daniels, much love Aww. and much love. I appreciate you Absolutely. and thank you. And God bless you. Yes. And, and somebody said, where can you go to see it? Social Conflict. I'm sorry, WorthTV.com. The movie's there now. God bless you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chike. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Okay. Chica. Okay, see, thank you, Chike. What does it mean? The power of God. I will never make that mistake again. Chike, the power Real, of God. I'm going to tell you a funny story before I leave. Funny story. So in Philadelphia, Shirley Ralph was throwing um, Diva Simply Singing. And she had Monifa and Faith on the bill. So oh, wow. Faith back and I brought Faith a present, and Monifa came out. And I said, Monifa, can you please take this present back to face for me? So Monifa had been calling me Chike, but I never corrected her. <laughs> so she went back to Faith. And she told Faith, she was like, yeah, this came from Chike. And Faith was like, who? And she was like, Chike, you know, Chike, the, 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 the podcaster, the journalist. And she was like, you mean Chike? Ah! <laughs> I love it. And it would be Faith who would know how to pronounce her name right. Yes, I love it. Monifa came back from backstage and cussed me out. She was like, "You know, why are you telling me?" What <laughs> I was like, "But you're Monifa. I, I shouldn't, you know. I, I, no. I didn't want to, you know." She was like, "No, that's She was like, "You respect your own name, and you make people call you with your name." Right, so, right. It's like because I spell my name with two C's, they calling me Nietzsche. I'm like, "This ain't Gucci. This is Nikki." <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No. I love it. Okay, TK, I will I never make you. that mistake again. It's all N good. It's nice all good. to meet Much you. All right, God bless y'all. Bye-bye.